um, ladies and gentlemen, it's a great honor for the European Academy of Dermatology and Venereology to be invited to this meeting, which has been organized by the European Cancer Patient Coalition, ECPC, in these difficult times. I think it's amazing that we are going to talk about a problem which is not related to the pandemic, but which will be of great importance for all of us for a very long time. It is being elicited by a physical force, UV radiation, which is invisible. We can't feel it, we can't sense it, and maybe that's the reason why we do completely neglect the effects of this UV radiation on the human body, even though it is causing the most frequent cancer of all cancers in females and males. And obviously there's one group of persons, human beings, who are particularly exposed to UV radiation and that is outdoor workers. And it would basically be easy to protect them from UV radiation but this is not happening in most workplaces in Europe. And I hope with today's event, something will change. And for that reason, I'm very happy to hand over now to the director of ECPC, the European Cancer Patient Coalition, which is Mrs. Antonella Cardone. Thank you, Sven, and uh, I would also like to uh, echo your uh, nice uh, words, uh, welcoming all the participants uh, to this event. Um, I will uh, uh, provide uh, uh, some uh, few uh, uh, information details on the housekeeping rules. Uh, so we will uh, um, uh, allow participants uh, to have uh, uh, um, to make uh, comments or questions uh, and they can choose uh, how to make their comments or questions uh, if uh, on the chat or uh, live uh, if uh, they want uh, to uh, ask uh, the, the question uh, live then uh, they need uh, to raise uh, the hand and uh, uh, we will uh, uh, turn on your uh, microphone and if you wish also your camera uh, this meeting is uh, video recorded so that uh, we can share the details, uh, uh, I mean, the, 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 the video also with the people who could uh, not attend uh, this uh, specific event. Uh, just uh, uh, a remark, uh, this uh, uh, meeting is uh, also co-organized uh, by the Parliamentary Intergroup on Cancer, uh, Challenge Cancer. Uh, so the agenda is uh, very intense. Uh, we have, uh, uh, right after me, we will have a keynote speaker. Uh, we uh, will have uh, uh, Professor Alexander Stratigos uh, introducing and setting the scene. And then we will have a panel discussion with the distinguished uh, um, uh, speakers. Uh, we have uh, a representative from the European Parliament, uh, Jens uh, uh, we have a, a representative from the European uh, Commission, uh, Laura Vicente, uh, and then uh, we have uh, um, uh, a patient representative and then uh, uh, representatives of, from the stakeholders uh, groups uh, that we work uh, with. So without uh, any further delay, uh, I'll give the floor back to um, uh, John Sven to introduce uh, uh, the uh, keynote uh, speaker. Yes, well, thank you very much, Antonella. Yes, it's a great pleasure for me uh, to introduce uh, Professor Stratigos, who is the president of the European Scientific Institution for Dermatology, which is the European Academy of Dermatology and Venereology. And he is the head of the most important dermatological university hospital in Athens. So Alexander Stratigos, I'm very happy to open the floor for you. Professor Stratigos, just go ahead. Well, thank you very much for this uh, uh, wonderful introduction. I hope you can see my slides. And I'm, I'm very excited and, and honored to be uh, representing the EADB in this uh, important uh, event and speaking on a very important and unfortunately neglected subject as, as was mentioned previously. First of all, I'd like to congratulate the uh, European Cancer Patient 
coalition for its consistent efforts, not only with this particular event, uh, but with others as well, to bring this issue really out of the shadows into the forefront. And I'd like to particularly acknowledge the, the pivotal role that uh, the chair of this session, Professor Sven Yong, has uh, really devoted his, his work and his uh, energy and his commitment to really raise this topic to the public eye, to policy uh, decision makers, and, and for coordinating this really uh, very big effort to uh, raise this issue of occupational skin cancer. I'd like to, to set the stage uh, here for the discussion that has, will be following. And first of all, I'll give you some basic facts about non-melanoma skin cancer. And when we talk about skin cancer, we, we usually tend to think about melanoma, but the most common types actually are basal cell carcinoma and squamous cell carcinoma. You can see some clinical pictures here. Uh, and particularly squamous cell carcinoma can start as a precancerous lesion that we call actinic keratosis. And these tumors often present as small uh, red scaly plaques or, or nodules uh, that usually present on very uh, uh, sun exposed areas such as the face, the head, the ears, the, the neck, and also the dorsal parts of the head, the areas that take more exposure from, from the sun. And what's really detrimental about the epidemiology of non-melanoma skin cancer is that it's by far the most common uh, cancer in, in humans overall. If you add all human cancers together, they will not match up with the number of cases of non-melanoma skin cancer that we diagnose every year. And it's also rapidly increasing uh, over the years in, in first skin populations worldwide. And we know that the major risk factor in, in, in the vast majority of cases is exposure to solar UV radiation. I would call it better overexposure. And we know that solar UV radiation is a group one carcinogen as declared by the WHO, that we have raising uh, increased levels of UV, particularly because of environmental factors such as the ozone depletion. But on the other side of the coin, skin cancer is an issue, a, a, a disease that can be easily detected even by naked eye. And prevention is really easy as you will uh, see uh, further below. But it can become a lifelong chronic disease and patients may develop multiple tumor because of the effects of, of chronic sun exposure. The risk factors for, for, for skin cancer are usually a fair skin type consisting of fair skin, blue eyes, red hair, increased number of freckles and often family history and genetic factors may play a role. But we have to be very clear that even though this type of phenotype is the more common one that is affected by skin cancer, anyone can actually be affected by skin cancer, even those skin types that we consider more resistant. And there are usually two types of, of UV radiation exposure that can cause skin cancer. One is the one that we uh, receive uh, from recreational purposes, for example, going out in the beach, et cetera, or being exposed to sun beds. And they're particularly now the clothing is, is, is in a way that allows more UV to penetrate the skin. And of course, travel patterns today have really changed the way that we are exposed to the sun. But there's another type of risk, which is the occupational risk. This is the risk that outdoor workers receive. Those that are engaged in outdoor work, for example, farmers, gardeners, seafarers and construction workers and, and workers in, in the public section that are you know, really exposed to the sun over the time of their work uh, while they're doing their activities. And that's an important and often neglected way that um, uh, UV radiation can actually affect uh, the health of the skin. And this is important because it does affect a very large number of, of, of people, 14 million EU workers who are actually spending more of 75% of their work time outside, exposed to the sun, to the direct UV radiation. And for them, for the outdoor workers, it's 100% it's increased cancer risk because they're continuously exposed. And there's some very interesting data by dosimetry suggesting that outdoor workers do receive a very significant uh, exposure with all, about 600 standard erythema dose per year. If you can imagine that one standard erythema dose is the one that gives you a sunburn, you can imagine what 600 SEDs actually means for the skin. And there are some studies that show that the uh, exposure limits uh, are usually uh, 
uh, over uh, exposed in, in the skin of outdoor workers, uh, exceeding almost five times the, the, the normal accepted uh, dose, which is 1.3 SEV. So there's a significant amount of overexposure occurring in, in those workers and individuals who are outside of the sun. And unfortunately, despite these quite uh, supportive uh, evidence, skin cancer is recognized as an occupational disease only in six European countries. But even in those countries, there's a significant underreporting of these, of these skin cancers. So workers lack information and they lack protection. And, and it's very important that often there's a very decreased awareness among outdoor workers about the very simple things that actually can prevent this uh, disease from happening. Here are some data from the UK, and you can see that on the left side, you can see the graph, uh, which I think speaks for itself in the UK. UV radiation is recognized as the fourth in magnitude among the top 10 chemical and physical agents causing more than 85% of cancer cases in the workplace. And on the right side, you can see that in Germany, which has recognized uh, non-melanoma skin cancer as an occupational uh, disease, you can see that there's a uh, increased number of cases, almost 30,000 cases since 2015 when the disease has been officially recorded in the, in the registers. That makes it actually the number one occupational cancer for outdoor workers and also a very common, the second most common occupational disease. There's often a, a concept that skin cancer is something that can be easily handled. That, uh, diagnosed and then you treat it and you remove it and then you're cured. But the reality for most of the patients is that this is not really the case. There's a significant reduction of quality of life because this is a chronic and often recurrent disease. Non-melanoma skin cancer patients often undergo repeated surgery. And this happens particularly in sensitive areas such as the face and the head and neck. So there's a consequence from these uh, uh, procedures that actually will affect the appearance, the self-esteem, and the well-being. And by the way, many of these individuals will develop skin cancer towards the end of their working life or after the retirement when prevention is really too late. The good news, of course, is that skin cancer is highly preventable in the first place. And the protection is really easy. And you can see these very important four steps that can be taken. Uh, and that can actually manage this issue very effectively. So health education, health awareness about effective sun protection is very important and, and very easy also to convey to, uh, to individuals. And then the organizational and technical interventions that can take place, changing working hours, avoiding the sun at the peak hours, installing sails and sun owings in the workplace, these are all uh, measures that can actually protect uh, the skin from the overexposure of ultraviolet radiation. Clothing is also important, particularly with a placement of a hat or a long seat shirt. And then the final important measure is the regular use of effective sunscreen with an SPF of about 30. And this is usually the most common type of, of sun protection that is being used. There's other important developments that I think are uh, worth mentioning. For example, the WHO in its International Classification of Diseases and the most recent revision of ICD-11, uh, which was endorsed by the WHA, actually does provide a coding specifically for squamous cell carcinoma for one type of skin cancer if it is related to occupation, whether that's the primary factor that has caused the skin cancer or it's a cofactor. But the important thing that it is addressed now as an occupational health uh, problem. And there's certain other important activities that have taken place. For example, this white paper, this position statement that was authored uh, by uh, Sven Yon. And this has been a joint position statement um, uh, created by patient advocacy groups, by medical association, by international organization, focusing on occupational health and the role of skin cancer in the occupational setting. And in this uh, paper, there were you know, four very important aspects that were actually emphasized. The need to, first of all, report non-melanoma skin cancer occurring at the, at the uh, um, occupational setting. And that's important because we don't have right now numbers that would indicate the magnitude of the problem. If you don't have numbers, if you don't have registration of cases, 
then you know there's no way that you can really estimate uh, the importance of the problem. So one thing is registration of non-melanoma skin cancers related to occupational. Uh, setting. The second is targeted prevention measures for outdoor workers, and that means prevention on first place, but it also means screening, early detection, access to care, follow up, all the management that we use for skin cancer that needs to be incorporated into the occupational setting as well. And concentrated action is needed by the different stakeholders. This cannot be the result of uh, one person or one group, so this needs to be a concentrated and coordinated effort. And we're very pleased that the European uh, Beating Cancer Plan that has been announced by the European Commission does provide a lot of opportunities to address these unmet needs and actually uh, raise the issue about overexposure uh, to UV radiation as an important health risk issue, uh, not only addressing the occupation of skin cancer, but also uh, exploring measures that could reduce uh, exposure to ultraviolet radiation, also from other sources, for example, sunbeds, which we also know that increases the risk of melanoma and non-melanoma skin cancer. So what are the important steps? Well, apply regular health surveillance and education for outdoor workers, increase the awareness and make sure that you um, have appropriate health interventions that will protect the outdoor workers from the risk of uh, skin cancer, but also really manage these when these occur in these patients. Ensure that notification and registration of non-melanoma skin cancer specifically in outdoor workers. Drive policy action to non-melanoma skin cancer prevention. And this is something very important that the Europe's uh, Beating Cancer Plan uh, will be able to, to address. Recognize in member states non-melanoma skin cancers and occupational disease in countries and improve prevention measures at the workplace, which is cheap, it's easy, it can be easily applied and implemented, and it can make a huge difference in terms of the outcome and the uh, occurrence of skin cancer. The ADV launched uh, uh, an, an important uh, uh, call to action through a uh, multi-stakeholder summit that took place in April 2019, and Sven Yon was uh, uh, organizing this uh, very important uh, uh, multi-stakeholder uh, uh, meeting, which actually focused on the importance of raising awareness about non-melanoma skin cancer and also driving policy action to recognize non-melanoma skin cancer as an occupational disease. And there were very important points that were raised within this uh, meeting that actually end up with this global call to action to end the non-melanoma skin cancer epidemic in the outdoor uh, working uh, uh, setting. So just a few uh, take home messages, uh, which I, I hope will uh, raise the, uh, and set the scene for the discussion that will follow. Non-melanoma skin cancer is an important occupational health issue, which has not been properly addressed and that affects millions of outdoor workers. And certainly the event to, of today uh, will help us uh, raise even more awareness about this. We need to widely recognize non-melanoma skin cancer as an occupational disease and take measures with that, improve prevention measures and implement health related interventions at the workplace. And this can only occur as a coordinated effort of many different stakeholders, healthcare professionals, employers, policy makers, governments, trade unions, patient advocate groups, only with the concentrated effort of all these parties we will be able to achieve to reduce skin cancer in outdoor workers and raise uh, the health status in this particular population. So thank you very much for your attention and I look forward to taking place, to taking uh, participation to your discussion. Yes, thank you very much, Professor Stratigos. Actually, we've got one of the most distinguished dermatologists uh, in Europe and also Professor Stratigos is a dermato-oncologist. So he's an expert on skin cancer and we're very happy to have had him. And I think he has made extremely clear what kind of disease burden is connected with non-melanoma skin cancer. And um, that um, there is so much individual suffering for a very long time because this is a chronic disease, it always comes back um, in spite of all the efforts of dermatologists. And for that reason, we have to do something on the preventive side in order to make sure that it doesn't happen. So, um, we would be in the face of the discussion now, and I think we've got excellent information to do the discussion. 
Um, but then we have um, Mr. Gierig actually, and he has to go for another meeting dealing with cancer. And for that reason, he's asked us to be able to deliver his statement um, at 11.45, which is about the time. So I hope that um, uh, Mr. Giesecke, a member of the European Parliament, um, uh, will be able to speak to us now. Would that still be okay? That is perfect. If I'm unmuted and if everyone can hear me. Yes, we can hear you. If that is the case, it is perfect. First of all, I want to start by thanking uh, the European Cancer Patient Coalition, the ECPC, for organizing this webinar on such an important topic. Of course, my thank goes to Mr. Jon from Osnabrück, from my constituency in Lower Saxony. We are very close normally, but today I am broadcasting from Brussels, right from the premises from the European Parliament. You have been here with your organization several times, Professor Jon. Uh, Ms. Gardone, uh, Professor Strategos, all participants uh, being part of this uh, webinar, a warm welcome from my side. Uh, skin cancer is a huge problem. We all know that, um, but it seems that uh, people out, outside, outdoor workers, not uh, having this uh, knowledge. Between two and three million people are diagnosed around the globe each year with um, non melanoma skin cancer. Exposure to UV. Uh, radiation is the leading cause for NMSC worldwide, and it is the most uh, common form of cancer. We heard this in the, in the um, introductory speech of uh, Professor Strategios. Um, it is especially dangerous for outdoor workers. The amazing number of 14.5 million workers in EU spending at least 75% of their working hours in Europe alone and recent studies show that outdoor workers have at least double the risk of developing NMSC compared to the general population. It represents European outdoor workers' number one enemy. Uh, to name one example, from Germany since 2014, the German accident social insurance system has carried out assessments of outdoor workers. And it was shown that for outdoor workers yearly, exposure to UV exceeded thresholds levels by five times and more. Preventing skin cancer have benefits for healthcare system and economy. In Germany, for example, direct costs for inpatient treatment accounts for over 130 million euro a year. And uh, this has already been pointed out. Skin cancer prevention will not only lead to a reduction of costs, um, but it will also increase the quality of life, the work and productivity. It has huge impact on GDP. And so from political side, from the European Parliament, you all know that um, your call for action in 2019, it was not without effect. We as EPP had this as part of our program for the European elections to beat cancer, not this skin um, cancer, not this specific, but generally to fight against cancer. And you, 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 you all recognized that we made some progress and um, in September um, 2020, finally, we managed to have our special committee um, on um, uh, combating cancer, the, the BICA. There I'm a substitute member. Uh, we will work at least one year. There is even the possibility uh, to have a prolongation of this mandate for another six months. And I think uh, we, we have a good, we, we did a very good job uh, jobs so far. By 2024, we aim to make significant contribution to fight against cancer through a holistic approach and a variety of legislative and non-legislative measures in the areas of prevention, early detection, uh, treatment, and follow-up. Um, and the European Commission, they will come later in the, in the discussion. They have presented the Europeans beating cancer plan. But the question uh, to me was how we can how can we uh, protect um, the, the 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 workers from this um, NMSC, and I think um, um, perhaps in a way contradictory to the statement of Mr. Stratigos, it is not the lack of information. The information is there. The assessments are there. We have the data. We have everything. But the information does not come to the affected people. There is, there is a lag. 
we have to have to have a, um, a possibility to bring all this valid information, all the studies to the outdoor workers that they can adapt all the measures you pointed to, uh, to change the working hours, not to work uh, between 11 and one outside, all these things. But we need to guarantee that all the information we have really go to the outdoor worker. And of course, this event here is, is very valuable, very good because it raises awareness and we have the information. But if it is really necessary to, from a legislative point of view, uh, to uh, oblige employers to, to give this information to the workers, there we have to see if we need regulation or if it is sufficient just to do soft law, so to say, and to inform and to guarantee that the inform the information goes to the workers. There we have to see. Um, in general, I'm pretty um, reserved not to have anything regulated in detail. So I would not say in, in Europe, we should in the Southern parts of Europe, the Mediterranean, um, just to work from six to nine and then from five to eight. And then as a European law binding the hours, that would not be the right approach. So we have to recognize the principle of subsidiarity. But my key point is, and that would be my answer, how can we guarantee that all the information we have already, it's not a problem of luck information, that this information goes to the workers. There we have to have this coordinated uh, uh, um, effort. This webinar is one part. Our committee is another part. And we have to raise awareness and guarantee that the information gets to the right people. Thank you. Yeah, Mr. Giesecke, this was excellent. Um, thank you very much for this statement. Thank you very much for being active uh, in the committee uh, of BC and Cancer. And I absolutely agree that what we have to do is making sure that this Europe's BC and Cancer plan is now filled with some contents and that we do really make something out of it. And all your suggestions are very much appreciated. And um, definitely that would be a start actually to uh, improve on workers' education. And we've already heard from Professor Stratigos, and that's what he said actually, that um, if we do investigations in workers, whether they know about the risk they are running at the workplace, then we find out they don't. So what you are supposing uh, uh, improving in workers' education and what Professor Stratigos was uh, uh, suggesting, that is absolutely necessary. So good actually that the members of the European Parliament know about the problems, and now we together have to make sure actually that something's happening. Obviously, from a dermatological point of view, it's absolutely clear it would be good to work on the directive on optical radiation, which is only for artificial UV radiation at the moment. And I think there should be something amended on solar UV radiation. It just would be necessary. And then to consider actually to make it a, a, an occupational disease on the European level, not only in six countries. That would certainly be extremely help, helpful to help those people who are affected. And we see them every day and they keep suffering for such a long time. And obviously they also say, well, if I only had known, I would have changed my, my uh, behavior at the workplace, but they don't know. So I think there's a great agreement and thank you very much for your work. This is absolutely essential for getting some progress in this. Yes, and now we are open for the discussion, but we have further statements. Um, in order um, to have the basis for a discussion. And I'm very happy that uh, we have Mrs. Laura Vicente, um, who is a policy officer, risk management policy team of um, the DG Employment from the European Commission. And I hope she can hear us. And it would be great if we had your statement. Mrs. I can hear you perfectly. Can you hear me? Yes, fantastic. Thank you very much for being with us. Thank you very much for inviting me. <laughs> it's a pleasure for me to be to be here and as a Spaniard is also something and, and previously uh, work as an OS inspector in the construction sector in Spain. Uh, it's it's a, a, a topic that really um, I'm really interested in and uh, um, uh, I will speak today because I think it has cha been changed to, in some documents but not in others, not about the Europe's beating cancer plan, I will mention it at the end of my presentation, but I'm gonna talk about the EU health and safety at work legislation and how can it contribute to uh, the prevention of non-melanoma skin cancer. 
Uh, I think the data has already been highlighted by, by previous speakers. We have more than, uh, than um, 40 million workers, outdoor workers that are potentially exposed to, to this risk, to the risk of exposure to 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 ultra to UV radiation, and I think that shows the, the importance of tackling this risk at um, at the general level. From my side, I would like to provide you with some reference uh, uh, to the existing EU policy and legal context. Um, in the first place, the right to a healthy, safe and well-adapted work environment for every worker is uh, recognized at the highest political level, being one of the principles of the European pillar of, of social rights. In the area of occupational safety and health, there is a complete set of EU legislation. And um, this legislation sets the principles and the obligations for employers to address occupational risks. And of course, this includes those risks that the risks that are the, the or, at the origin of skin cancer. Uh, the framework directive applies to every employer in all sectors of activity, and uh, it sets the obligation of employers to identify, assess, and control every risk. Um, as a result of this assessment, the employer has to put in place uh, preventive and protective measures uh, that um, on the basis of the general principles, that is the first one should be elimination of the risk at source. It does not seem to be very easy when we are speaking about solar uh, light. Then uh, um, implementation of organization, organizational measures that have already uh, also been, been stressed, like for example, avoiding the peak hours. Um, providing workers, and I think this is uh, uh, very important with the information, training and instructions that uh, so that the workers really know to which uh, 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 risks they are exposed and the reasoning behind the, the, the measures the employer is telling them to use. Because sometimes this is missed and there is, we can find a gap between the measures on the paper and the measures really implemented by workers. This is the reason why informing them of the use of, this, of these measures to prevent um, uh, health illness is so important. Uh, this, 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 another a further step will be the introduction of collective protective measures at a, as uh, shade covers, for example. And finally, when the risk cannot be sufficient, sufficiently limited by other, other measures, the employer should supply uh, outdoor, wor outdoor workers with personal protective equipment. Those are the, the, the principles in the framework directive that I have said that they apply to every sector of activity and to every employer. But other directives of the, uh, in the field of occupational safety and health also uh, have particular provisions on outdoor workers. And uh, um, for example, uh, we have the construction sites uh, directive, workplaces directive, or the directives on mining. And they state that workers must be protected against atmospheric influences which could affect their health and safety. Finally, the, the directive on, on personal protective equipment in its uh, one of its annexes has a list of, of PPEs that can be used against the risk arising from exposure to solar radiation. And it includes um, caps and glass, sunglasses, barrier creams or uh, protective clothing. But of course, we can see that legislation is not effective itself because the legislation is there. Now it needs to be transposed by member states and effectively applied at the workplaces. Only with that, uh, the, 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 the protection and with enforcement of the legislation, the, the, there might be a, a change at the workplace for workers. It is important therefore to, to support the practical implementation, providing information and good practices on the best ways uh, to apply such legislation. 
for example, the Commission has issued different uh, guidance to support employers in fulfilling their obligations. I will mention, for example, the construction sites or fishing vessels or agricultural, uh, the guidance on the agricultural uh, sectors, and they contain, contain useful information for employers as regards the management of risks resulting from exposure to UV radiation. <coughs> Excuse me. I would also like to highlight the, the role of the agency uh, in Bilbao, EU OSA, the agency, um, European Agency for Safety and Health at Work. Uh, they have an important role in uh, raise awareness, providing good practices, and also drawing the attention of employers of the benefits uh, from, from the point of view of productivity and business. And the, the agency, has also, um, I will mention some of the tools they have available for, for employers, like the OSRIC information on occupational exposure to natural uh, UV radiation and prevention, the online interactive risk assessment tools for maritime transport and agriculture. They also include some items on solar radiation and also a compilation of tools and guidance documents developed by member states, for example, on sun uh, protection in construction. One of the future projects or current projects of, of, the, of the EU OSA is to develop a new survey to estimate workers' exposure to carcinogens in the EU. And I think it's important uh, uh, to highlight that uh, this time it, it, the information will be very broad, the, the risks considered will be very broad, and it will include exposure to, to, to solar radiation. Of course, the, the, the survey will contribute to gathering data on cancer risk factors uh, and to contribute to evidence-based uh, policy making. As regards enforcement, uh, labor inspectors should be aware of the specific risks uh, uh, to which adult workers are exposed, able to provide a, a specific advice uh, to employers. The Commission promotes effective and equivalent enforcement, uh, for enforcement across EU through the initiatives carried out by the Senior Labor Inspectors Committee. And uh, for instance, the guidance to support labor inspectors in assessing quality of the risks assessment and uh, including uh, risks from exposure to, to solar radiation. Um, I will also finalize now by speaking about uh, the, the upco upcoming uh, strategic framework uh, on health and safety at work for the period 2021-2027 that it's planned for adoption in June, so I hope in the following weeks we will <laughs> uh, find it. It will be adopted, and and it will contribute to to other EU initiatives. For example, to the Beating Cancer Plan, we cannot forget that 52 percent of the annual occupational deaths in the EU can be attributed to work-related cancer, which is. Uh, a huge number. <laughs> so there's still much to do. Um, the, the, the strategic framework will contribute to the key action one prevention of this European uh, uh, beating cancer plan uh, by tackling chemical carcinogens, uh, by updating the, the carcinogens and mutagens directive. And it will also contribute to the, to the key action four, improving the quality of life of cancer, cancer patients, survivors, and, and carriers. And uh, um, here, um, the strategic framework will look into psychosocial risks and uh, disadvantages groups, including uh, cancer survivors that are of, uh, often faced with obstacles when returning to, to work. I will finalize by highlighting the, the importance of prevention. Prevention is the golden rule for this policy area. And we have already heard that uh, there are basic uh, uh, measures, uh, cheap and, and simple, that, that uh, can, be, can be implemented at the workplaces to prevent this, this disease. And uh, of course, at EU level, the main objective for this policy area and legislation is to promote a culture of risk prevention to improve workers' protection and promoting better knowledge, uh, improve the application of legislation, and of course, promoting best ways of tackling this risk. Thank you very much uh, for your attention. This is the end of my presentation. Thank you.
Well, thank you very much, Mrs. Richent. Actually, that's um, excellent to have um, the basic knowledge that there is some legal regulations that might work at workplaces, but we know they don't. So really the question is, how do we transfer this to the workplaces as we've heard from Mr. Giesecke also. Um, regarding the 14.5 million workers that are uh, exposed as outdoor workers being 75% of the working time outdoors, we can say that according to the measurements which uh, Professor Strategos um, has mentioned, we know that you don't need to be 75% uh, outdoors in order to double your risk for skin cancer. Uh, the new German definition is one hour a day and 50 days between April and September between 11 and four o'clock, because this is when the UV exposure peaks. And this is alone in Germany, 6 million workers. So if you have that for the EU, it's more than 60 million actually that are exposed relevantly, as we know that the um, um, exposure is so high. And obviously, again, if you, if you work, if you uh, argue in terms of, uh, um, let's say, um, exposure limits, which you have for so many carcinogens, you have addressed the um, carcinogen and mutagen directive, and you have addressed the survey by EU OSHA in Bilbao, where we've been frequently, actually. And, um, well, I mean, it's a group one carcinogen, UV radiation by WHO, like um, asbestos, um, like plutonium. And just imagine a plutonium worker who would exceed this threshold by five times. You would be extremely active if that happened. EU OSHA would be. But we know from the measurements that all the outdoor workers do regularly exceed that. Actually, not only in Europe, also in Canada, we have recent measurements there. And so for that reason, there's really something we need to do more. And for instance, in Germany, actually, we've now explicitly um, obliged the employer to look for the risk of UV radiation. It's, they are generally obliged to look for occupational threats. But now specifically, they are forced to do that. And they have to provide um, occupational physicians to do surveys and to do regular surveillance. I think that would be absolutely important to make sure what you proposed, which is prevention. You will only get prevention done if you have surveillance. Otherwise, you will not be able to transfer that to the workers. Anyway, thank you very much. Actually, maybe there's a remark. We are a bit ahead of time, but we could actually have a question. Um, at least one question. I don't see anybody. You could just open your microphone, come in. No, if that's not the case. I'm very uh, happy actually um, to um, introduce um, our patient representative which is um, Mr. Anthony Long, and he will give us in, some insight in the life of a patient who's got non-melanoma skin cancer. Mr. Long, just go ahead. Thank you very much. Can you, can you hear me and yes, see me? absolutely, yes. all fine. Very good, thank you. Well, I'm, I'm joining this seminar because um, I'm hoping that my experience might be relevant for the way non-melanoma skin cancers are thought about in the new initiatives to beat cancer. I'm not here to advocate any particular position. Uh, I'm here really to share my experiences in the hope that others can draw lessons. I start from the fact that I'm a long-term sufferer of both melanoma and non-melanoma skin cancers going back at least 30 years. It was around my 40th birthday when I became fully aware of my susceptibility to skin cancers. I think one of the doctors treating me at that time explained that my vulnerability was rooted in my DNA. I don't, I'm not medically qualified enough to know whether that's true or not, but it came as a, a real shock to me to think that, that, that I was afflicted in this way. And why it came as a shock is it because it meant that whatever precautions were being urged on me by my friends and my colleagues and my family from, to wear sun hats, to wear clothing, protective UV clothing, 
um, to avoid direct sun, to use sunscreens, etc. All of these were no doubt necessary and important and sensible, but on their own, they were not enough. If skin cancers were in my DNA, then what was to prevent fresh outbreaks from appearing almost randomly? That was my question. And I also wondered, how did all of this happen to me? Um, I've never quite understood why I should have had this such a strong uh, susceptibility to skin cancers. I always thought perhaps they were the result of some serious one-off sunburns when I was in my teens. But I wondered also, as some doctors have suggested, that it might have been a genetic uh, disposition in my family. Or could it have been a lack of awareness generally when I was growing up in the 1950s and 1960s? Or now, as I've heard uh, this morning, the prevalence of the UV radiation brought on in no small part by the thinning of the ozone layer and the intensity of, of, the, of the sun. So, Pat, and, and Professor Stratigos mentioned all of these uh, in his remarks, and, and I don't know which, probably it's the combination of all of those and even more that, that may have made me so susceptible. But my main goal now, and my main goal in my remarks, is to learn how to deal with the condition. In other words, how to build my life around it and adapt to it. And what does that mean? Well, it means that for after my 40th birthday, for the next 15 years, my, my treatment involved periodic visits to dermatologists, usually with surgeries at their homes near where I lived. Diagnosis was based on the doctor's visual inspection and any suspect or irregular skin condition would mean a biopsy, usually followed by a positive lab result and inevitably followed a few days later, a few weeks later by the removal of a lesion or several lesions and two or three weeks worth of dressings and, and other discomfort. But the next 15 years, at around about 2005 onwards, all of that changed. Uh, it was no longer sporadic and and, uh, and, and happening from time to time, it became very much more a routine uh, set of hospital appointments. And why was that? Well, it was because a specialist examination in 2005 by Belgium's leading dermatologist, Dr. Veronique Delmar Moll, who at that time was pioneering the use of digital images to record changes in skin conditions using a handheld camera and her own personal computer resulted in me being admitted to hospital and being operated on to remove 20 or more lesions at the same time. That was the beginning of a regular course of hospital treatment that continues to this day. So this is my journey and I show you, I, I mentioned 2005. Here we have my medical history of diagnosed skin cancers. Um, normally around about two or three per year diagnosed. Peaks in 2013 of seven diagnosed skin cancers, six diagnosed skin cancers in 2019. Um, so you can see the pattern and very much fits what uh, uh, Professor Stratigos mentioned in his remarks, that these aren't just one-off events that, uh, that you go through and then everything's fine and you go back to normality. This is a, as you said, Professor, a chronic condition. And so what, what are the lessons I take from this? And these are my concluding remarks. The first is the one that I just said. It's, it's a permanent uh, process of, of, of treatment that one has to go through. 
and something you have to learn to live with. That's the first remark. Second, each of those bars, although it doesn't seem like it, but each of those bars that you're looking at represents a large number of hospital visits. Four hospital visits um, for routine examinations are mandatory for me. So that's, that's once every three months I must go to the hospital. Assuming a positive identification of a lesion or sometimes several lesions, a minimum of two and sometimes three hospital visits for the surgery itself, the removal of the stitches, and plus occasionally difficulties with the healing. So it's a very disruptive to work patterns as well as, um, as discomfort in daily living. Thirdly, some of these, these lesions are located in especially uncomfortable places. For instance, on the face, on the nose, or sometimes in places where you've had previous operations and where the skin is rather thin. And those often then require visits to the day hospital. And quite often that also may involve a general anesthetic rather than a local anesthetic. Fourthly, any surgery requiring stitches and dressings and strict hygiene for healing will require a convalescent period of normally 15 days and sometimes 21 days where not too many stresses are placed on the body and where bathing and showering are restricted. And finally, all of that means for indoor and outdoor workers who suffer from this affliction, the treatment can be disruptive for their work patterns and for their daily routines. For outdoor workers engaged in manual activity especially, it is not difficult to imagine that the convalescent period would be especially difficult, for instance, to secure the necessary sterile healing environment. So my conclusion, lots of vigilance, lots of checkups, lots of minor disruption to daily life, and sometimes more major disruptions. The need for generous and understanding employers who will be flexible to allow hospital visits, sometimes lots of them. It means surgery, mostly minor, but sometimes more major, which becomes a new and unexpected normal. And it means some discomfort while convalescing and some loss of mobility. But on the plus side, it means that you become part of a community, sometimes of fellow sufferers, but mainly the team of doctors and surgeons and nurses and interns and hospital staff looking after you year after year. That is a very special privilege and I would like to thank the caring community. It is those dedicated health professionals who I send my sincere thanks to today. Life goes on. I'm a very keen long distance cyclist. And as you can see with DNA or no DNA, I wear lots of protective clothing, sun hat, and lots of skin creams. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Long. I think we all have heard this shattering medical history and we can clearly say it is not your DNA. And it is not only your case. There are so many cases out there which are developing exactly the same. And you've made so clear actually what is the tremendous disease burden of skin cancer, of non-melanoma skin cancer in particular. And obviously one thing is absolutely clear. You've kindly mentioned the physicians actually that um, have provided all their care for you. And we don't know as physicians how we should cope with the drastic increase of these diseases. It's 10% every year in most European countries that these diseases increase. That means in 10 years with 100% increase and there's not the physicians to do that. We won't be able to do it. So that's another reason why we really have to indulge in prevention. So thank you very much for making that absolutely clear that we need to do something and all the best for you, of course. Right, um, now we are quite ahead of time, actually. So um, we will have to proceed directly to the next statement, which is from Rolf Gearing. And we have to ask him just to give us those ideas which we haven't heard before in order to get the thing finished. May we ask you this, Rolf? It's not an easy one. 
is not an easy one. Good morning or respectively good afternoon to all of you. And I can say that it is a, a real honor and it is also a pleasure for me being invited to, to this meeting. I think we have gathered here a few people who needs to be honored, who are restless working for cooperation, for communication and for progress, for societal progress in an area which is extremely important, not only for worker, for everyone, but for worker maybe a bit especially. So for me, it's an honor to be again with Antonella and, and Sven and all the others, but these two people are really working restless on, on this topic. Um, I think it is important to learn from each other. So we all have our experience, but that is mostly restricted. I will not talk again about this, uh, an aspect which is extremely well presented by, by Alexander and also in Sven's reaction, uh, his uh, yeah, very, uh, with, with emphasis, this reaction saying that we have enough scientific evidence that many of the skin cancers are work-related. We know more than enough. The question is, what are the what are the consequences and how can we bring the message across? That uh, guides me, before I show you uh, uh, two slides, uh, guides me to a reaction to Jens, who is unfortunately, I think, not any longer with us, but he was talking about the subsidiarity principle. And I think that is very important because it is a legal principle in the EU. It is an understanding on how our social life is functioning where do we regulate what, how do we solve problems? Um, but subsidiarity also means if I have not the proper reaction on the level where it is regulated best, then I need to act. And the European Commission is always saying when, when the Commission presents a new legal piece of uh, legislation, uh, why it is uh, justifiable to have EU legislation and not national or letting the issue to the social partners. Here the social partners are uh, requested and uh, we were talking about the question how to uh, inform people um, but uh, often when we talk about these aspects I have a little slide with a triangle and this triangle says you need acceptance of the problem, you need knowledge, and then you need application. So we have all the knowledge. That's clear, I, I just said, but we are confronted as trade union for the construction sector with partly not acceptance on the employer side. So what does it mean? From my point of view, it could mean regulation. I go now to, to my uh, two slides sharing with you. And I hope it works. Uh, I will start with this yes, one. Yes, it works perfectly. We can see it. Yeah. Okay. But I, I start with this one. And uh, I think you can see both. Huh? That uh, was not the intention. So, again, uh, the problem is uh, today we have representatives from construction uh, workers union and from agriculture. But it is a, a, a problem and a question that concerns more also public services, and maybe a lot of other sectors we have not in mind uh, for the moment. So it is not just a, a problem for specific sectors, it is an overall problem. And therefore it needs to dealt with in a societal perspective and also in terms of uh, regulation in a societal perspective. Um, I will also comment uh, uh, briefly or, or let's say, uh, complement to, to Laura Vincente's uh, presentation, which was uh, uh, impressive on the one hand, and was also showing the principles of the EU OSH legislation. So, um, but again, the, the problem of health and safety often is uh, the, the knowledge before acting correctly at workplaces doing the right prevention measures, we have to um, be aware we need the knowledge. And that is, I think, the reason why we have not only the framework directive with the basic 
um, obligation for the employer, but we have all the so-called daughter directive or single directive dealing with specific type of hazards. And there the employer gets some hints what to do because he can't know everything as a single employer don't know. We have a very good example for the moment uh, in the construction sector. We have a European exposure limit value for respirable crystalline silica. This dust you have everywhere in construction activities. But to prevent people correctly, you need to know. And the world of work is the most dynamic societal subsystem because of permanent innovation in terms of material, in terms of tools, in terms of combination of materials, technology. And that means the conditions for successful prevention also moves permanently. And that is something you can't, uh, that is an area where you can't say, okay, we have the subsidiarity principle, the social partners will find the best way. No, we permanently need communication and advice and advice is the main issue of the European OSH directives. So I move now to the next slide. It's not working this way, but this way. Okay. And uh, I will start here with, with, an, with a, an aspect uh, Laura has not touched. Um, and this aspect is of, of highest importance for victims. So we have just seen uh, what it means with the with the presentation before mine what it what what it means to be a victim in this area and uh, the recognition is is not just not just a formal aspect it is an individual right because laura started her presentation from my point of view very good with a reference to the european pillar of social rights and occupational safety and health is an individual right we currently have a discussion in the ILO making occupational safety and health a fundamental right. So, and that means if I have scientific evidence that a disease is or can be caused by work, and then it is a right of the worker that we get this disease recognized. We have a European list of occupational diseases, and that has been revised. Uh, if I'm not incorrect, twice this list, there were more, more changes and uh, communications from the European Commission, but it dates from 1962. And it still provides, from my point of view, a very good framework for our discussion. This European list of occupational diseases is not, not just a list of diseases, but it's also saying that we need better cooperation in science. We need, uh, we have a list of occupational diseases and we have a second list with diseases which are um, where, we, where we think it could be a, an occupational disease. And the idea of this communication, a recommendation from 1962 says, if we have new knowledge, then we need to adapt the list of occupational diseases. We take diseases from Annex 2 to Annex 1 is permanent progress based on scientific evidence and knowledge. So we have all the needed knowledge regarding skin cancer and non-melanoma skin cancer. That is our main demand that we do something here. I have not listed here the directive uh, Sven has already mentioned. We have a European directive from 2006 uh, dealing with optical uh, um, optical radiation, artificial optical radiation. And uh, before having this directive adopted, we had a lot of discussions whether or not uh, UV radiation needs to be covered. From our point of view, a revision of this directive is overdone and uh, we have to act on the European level. And then that is a bit beside our discussion, but will have effects uh, regarding prevention, but especially diagnosis and then treatments for victims and so on. We need to make the European list of occupational diseases uh, a directive. We need to transform it because what we can see is, between the European countries is that the number of recognized Euro, uh, occupational diseases is still differing extremely. So uh, if it is a worker's right, 
that an occupational disease is recognized as an occupational disease, then we have all the argument to make it a directive. Um, not, not robbing too much from the remaining time, I uh, stop here, but not without coming back to our own role. We are committed and we can present you also examples where uh, conditions have improved after the employers and the workers and the workers' representatives and unions recognized the problem, accepted the problem, gained the knowledge how to, do, how to react accordingly and how to prevent better and put it into practice. So we have examples, but these examples, as said, need also a good legal framework. That would be our main wish towards the European Commission, because Laura also said that we soon will see the strategic framework, but that is a strategic framework and it is in many parts very general and is not an operationalized action plan, but we have to bring it or to transform it into an operationalized uh, action plan on European level. And one thing or one aspect or one point in this action plan should certainly be the question of skin diseases, its recognition and better protection. So that is a bit uh, what we are working for. And we also would very much appreciate, uh, equally mentioned by Laura, that the, the Bilbao agency could play a very active role in that, maybe in combination with a slick campaign. Thank you for the attention. And, and um, yeah, also looking forward to discuss if we still have some minutes. Yes, uh, thank you, Raul, for your fabulous statement. Uh, quite clearly, if it is not being recognized as an occupational disease, um, our efforts for prevention won't work. I mean, the example of Germany has shown that. Only the very moment it became an occupational disease, all the preventive activities directed to our two workers have um, been um, enforced. So I can absolutely corroborate that. Unfortunately, we can't discuss this at the moment. Um, we hope that you stay, still stay with us because basically we are over time almost. And um, we still have a representative of the social partners in the EU, which is the representative of the trade unions in the area of food, agriculture and tourism trade unions. So we are very happy to have Arne Spahn to very briefly give us the ideas which have not been mentioned before. So in order to keep um, to the time frame which we have. Thank you very much, Arne. Yeah, thank you, thank you. Uh, uh, it's a pleasure. I try to, <laughs> to work with this uh, with this uh, computer here, and I I had it inside, and now it's gone. And where is this? Screen? I mean, we can hear you. We can see you, but we can't yeah. see any slides at the moment. Yeah, that is my problem. Maybe you have the. Yeah, I send it to the organizer. Maybe he can take over the the the, the presentation. Uh, ah, perfect, perfect. I got the information that Paulina will share share my slides. Thanks oh, a lot. Uh, so, thanks a lot for the invitation. Uh, it is really absolutely important that we go on with this, uh, uh, and uh, uh, I fully support what Rolf said for the construction sector, which is uh, that is not uh, he's using my photos, and uh, we share our uh, our political ideas and and the solutions we are we are working on. Uh, so thanks a lot for the for the for the. Uh, invitation today. Here's a photo of our uh, situation uh, in, in, in Spain. Maybe we can go to the next slide. There you have a lot of other uh, subsectors where we are really, um, really deeply involved in, in, in solar UV radiation uh, questions and uh, and uh, it is also, as an example in aquaculture, the reflection of water, uh, which creates a lot of new uh, aspects. The question on uh, how, where we can use with uh, technique, technical solutions and so on. Maybe next slide. And um, so it is absolutely important uh, to, uh, to uh, for, for, for technical solutions 
uh, do to look more deeply in the subsectors in the different areas. There's a big difference between glass houses or forestry, as an example, and the work in harvesting fruit, vegetables, winery, and, and, and so on. Um, but uh, the experts, of course, know all this situation. Thank you. Next slide. Next, yeah. So what we are, uh, what are the trade unions doing on, on level of farms and enterprises? Uh, we are looking for technical solutions, for organizational solutions, personal solutions, for technical solutions. It's absolutely important to develop also uh, new, new, new uh, tools, new, new uh, investments and in, uh, working out of sun, especially the questions of uh, creating shadow and uh, um, uh, creating moving shadow tools. At the end, this costs a lot of money and it, it must be very clear that uh, we need an, uh, a, a discussion how to um, go on with the, with these investments and, and uh, uh, this is an important tool, not only in agriculture. Uh, the, the, we developed a lot in, in, in uh, musculoskeletarian disorders with, with a lot of institutions like uh, Fraunhofer Institute and universities and so on. If we are looking to really technical solutions in mobile um, working places like you have it in the construction sector and on the, on the streets or on the fields in agriculture, the technical uh, um, level of, of uh, uh, solutions is quite weak. So it's also absolutely important to uh, focus more and stronger on these technical solutions. And I hope that OSHA will go on with us uh, on finding uh, new activities and uh, new steps on it. Second point is the organizational solutions, which is maybe not so important for uh, doctors and, and uh, medical uh, people, but for us in, in, in the working air field, it is absolutely information on what kind of information we give our employers that they are able to create solutions on, on the individual level of farm uh, and enterprises. Working time is absolutely important for this. But at the end, it's also the question how to deal with UV indexes and uh, what, what kind of information the employers have and uh, therefore I fully support what Rolf said, it's absolutely important to integrate the employers organizations in the discussion. The trade unions are inside the trade unions are active. As an example in Germany, the, the, the uh, social security schemes of, uh, of uh, uh, accident uh, prevention, the Big Bau and the SVLFG are um, giving the, the workers a, a package which includes sunglass, sunscreen, uh, uh, sunscreen, um, the, 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 uh, the card to identify what individual type you are and so on. So they just really, and this we give to thousands and thousands of workers on the workplace. So this is a good start but we need a more and stronger involvement in uh, of the employers and so maybe uh, you can also integrate more uh, the employers on your activities which are absolutely important for us as trade unions because we get a lot of information from your side which is absolutely necessary also to develop the last point the personal solutions at sunglasses covering closes the, the acceptance of the UV standard 801, which is really absolutely important, especially in agriculture, not only in creams, access to drinking water is absolutely a central point, in, especially in, in the Mediterranean area, uh, UV measures and, 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 and other things. Next, next slide, please. So, what we are working on information and advice, it was highlighted this on this conference. It's absolutely important to inform the workers about non-melanomic skin cancer. And it's also absolutely important to inform migrant workers about it in an easy way in the mother tongue based uh, uh, instruments. We are developing new electronic solutions uh, with uh, in collaboration with the at uh, um, administrations which are responsible in different member states 
uh, but also as trade unions by ourselves. And it's important to, to start this campaign on prevention, like we made it on the skin, the two square meters. It was also highlighted uh, sometimes in, in this conference. So it's necessary to campaign and prevent their next slide, please. And uh, then we come to the question, which was uh, also highlighted, the European list of occupational diseases where NS, uh, non melanoma skin cancer, uh, um, as when you, you said it, is not integrated and must be integrated there. We have to develop composition of the national social security uh, systems. We have uh, to create common uh, positions together with the medical experts. And we have to come to a common position inside the social partners, which is not the easy way Rolf uh, said about it. And then, of course, back to the solar UV radiation directive and the cooperation of the different actors. Thanks for this meeting today, which is a part of it. And the trade unions see you to back in the afternoon, where we have also another meeting with, I hope, a lot of more participants and uh, then we can uh, go on with the discussion there. Thank you very much. Next slide is, I think, I hope it's the last one. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you, Aunt. This was uh, completely comprehensive. And I know now that we have to get the employers on board and then let's see what can be done. Obviously, as you have already, um, as you have also corroborated, um, we need to have an occupational disease, um, and this is um, skin cancer, non-melanoma skin cancer by solar UV at the workplace. Actually, regarding the European list of occupational diseases, we can say there is non-melanoma skin cancer, indeed, but it is only due to tar. And the reason is that in the 18th century, in, for instance, Great Britain, they had these chimney boys, little boys to go in the chimneys and clean them. And they were exposed to tar, which is also uh, producing um, non-melanoma skin cancer, particularly squamous cell carcinoma. And that was actually the first ever described occupational disease, the first ever. But happily, there are no chimney boys anymore, certainly not in Great Britain, and I hope not in other parts of Europe. So, what is in this list is, is really history and not relevant. So we really must make sure that this list of occupational diseases is updated according to the knowledge which we have. So thank you very much for the statement. You are muted now. Sorry. I think we are now within questions and answers. And I think we have to probably um, start off um, with a chat and then go for further questions, unless there's something unsuppressible uh, directly from the audience. You could unmute your microphone and just have a question if you want to. Is there anybody who's got a question to the speakers? If that's not the case for the moment, we probably go through the comments in the chat. Um, sun protection, especially sunscreens, are quite expensive and are not affordable for many. Uh, would it maybe help if sunscreen was considered a medical tool and reimbursed to some extent? Well, clearly, and I think this is what we should discuss with the representative of the European Commission. As we've heard, work protection and personal protective equipment is something that has to be provided by the employer. So for that reason, if we speak for occupational skin cancer, well, then this is something which is an obligation for the employer. It definitely is in our country. I don't know what is the case in your countries. Please let us know. And maybe uh, Mrs. Vicente will, would like to have a statement on that. Just unmute your microphone if you want to, um, Ms. Vicente. Sorry. Yes, of course. It's uh, as I have already presented. Uh, sunscreen is uh, uh, can be considered 
as a, a PPE, personal protective equipment, if it is considered a fact in the, in the risk assessment, is on the employer. The obligation is on the employer to provide workers with, uh, with protective uh, cream. And, and it has to be noted that the preventive measures have to be at no cost for the, for the workers. I Sorry. Didn't the microphone. Sorry, that was a very <laughs> comprehensive statement. Thank you very much for, for this, actually. And quite clearly, Professor Stratigos has made that clear. Um, the first thing which we need to do is making sure that workers are not exposed. This can be due by all sorts of shields. Then, obviously, the next thing is to have proper clothing, including helmets, which also give you protection for the ears and for the neck. That's amazingly important. And um, then only there's the sunscreens. The reason is obviously that you're so much more effective with organizational measures, uh, making also sure that they don't have their um, breaks actually just in the sun in the time probably between 11 and four o'clock when UV radiation peaks. You can clearly say if your shadow is um, longer than yourself, then you are not at risk. That is usually the hours actually when the sun actually is not directly vertically above our planet and then much less UV is um, being transmitted through the atmosphere. But if your sun, if your shadow is shorter than yourself, then you really have to be careful. So uh, for that reason, uh, thank you very much for that statement. And then there's another idea here actually that sunscreen is not being used by workers um, because there might be an adherence of dusts. Well, we've recently made uh, an investigation on that topic. Uh, what could increase the acceptance of workers for sunscreens? And uh, we've made a market survey in Europe actually and asked all the um, respective companies actually to provide their products. And then we've looked for the adherence, for instance, of dust. And um, there's a lot of sunscreens uh, where there's no relevant adherence of dust. We've also looked for the question whether uh, after using the sunscreen, you're still able to um, hold um, a tool or make sure that you can um, be attached to a scaffold. And that also works well. Obviously, what you need to do is to apply the sunscreen some 15 minutes before you start working. If you do it immediately before you work, obviously, then that may be a problem. But that also would be something which has to be transmitted um, by workers' education. And again, if we ask workers, um, they usually don't know, unfortunately. Let's see if we've got any further questions. Yes, uh, the idea of having the cost for sunscreen uh, with a reduced um, VAT, uh, which was obviously the case in the Netherlands in between, but it isn't anymore. I think that's very good uh, for the general uh, population, it would be a very good idea to make sure that sunscreens are not um, expensive. And we've also heard from um, Arne Spahn that doing prevention on an occupational setting is expensive. And I can only say we've got so many calculations, for instance, from Australia, but also recently from Denmark. Uh, what is the payoff? What is the benefit? What is the return on prevention? If you do prevent, run prevention campaign, as we've heard from Arne Spahn, we should do. Um, what is the return on prevention? And the return at least is something like 2.5. So that clearly means if you get your money to the bank and they give you 250% interest, you would immediately do that. So that's amazing. I mean, we more have to ask, what is the cost of inactivity? And we feel that in Europe regarding skin cancer, it's more than a billion a year. If we don't do anything in terms of prevention, it's gonna be so much more expensive. So let's see what we've got here. Sven? Yes. Can I offer my remarks? If I oh, absolutely, just go ahead. Just two, two points, I think, because this has been really a very interesting and, and, and stimulating discussion. One, regarding sunscreens, we have to really emphasize the fact that sunscreen is, cannot be the only sun protective measure um, because sunscreens have their you know, limits and the effective sun protection is usually a combination of avoiding direct sun exposure 
using clothing and using sunscreen. So it's the, it's the triple effect that really produces the best possible. And often, you know, people rely more on, on, on sunscreen. They apply sunscreen and they think that that's probably going to be enough to protect them through the whole day. And this is something that we need to reinforce as a knowledge. And the second point I'd like to say is that uh, we, we've been seeing, and you mentioned that, that there's a rise in the incidence of skin cancer, despite the fact that for two or three decades now, we've been doing all these campaigns, awareness campaigns, uh, on sun protection, on early detection, and still we're seeing skin cancer increasing uh, as a problem, not only in the occupation setting, but also in the general public. And I think that is probably because we are relying a lot on personal behavior, and, and that can be something that can uh, vary a lot from person to person. And, you know, remember the public is hearing us speaking about sun uh, and all the health risks, but they're also, they know that sun is doing well for their health, uh, vitamin D, et cetera. So they're getting a lot of conflicting messages and sometimes that's not easy for them to really apply this in their everyday life. So I think this is why, um, you know, targeting specific high-risk groups such as outdoor workers, or children or adolescents, I think is important. And also providing legislative and, and policy rules and recommendations that, you know, change really the setting of, of sun protection in these places and for these populations is probably important more even than, you know, awareness and, and, and sun smart behavior that we have been so many years uh, advocating for. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much for this statement. And we can clearly say there is one experience which we have in the world, the only country where the incidence for non-melanoma skin cancer, also for melanoma skin cancer, is not increasing. The only country with a fair skin population, where this is the case, is Australia. And obviously the way that they have done it is perseverance. They have kept going with these campaigns and started at the very, very young, in order to make sure that they um, have sun smart behavior from the very start. And obviously that would be something we'd have to absolutely do. And then particularly look for high risk groups. And these are obviously the outdoor workers. So um, are there any further comments? I would just um, see if there's something in the chat. Yes, and we have actually that avoidance is even more important than protection. Yes, of course, if it's possible to stay out of the sun, do this, but that would be difficult with, uh, with um, outdoor workers. So for that reason, the priority of protection, organization, and then clothing, including hats, brimmed hats actually, and then for the rest, sunscreens, as Professor um, Stratigras has pointed out, that's absolutely important. Um, yes, some of the, you already had to leave. Is there another comment? Yes, Rolf, would you um, want to give a comment? Just go yeah. ahead. Yeah, that relates to the last discussion you, you had on uh, training and uh, acknowledge uh, the problem and information and so on. So we, uh, we try to educate or we try to change the habits of people who are 30, 40 years old. Uh, we should start earlier. And uh, so it needs to be a topic in schools. We have, a, we have a European structure, which uh, we should invite for a next meeting for, or for another meeting. That is the people around Initosh. Initosh is uh, promoting experiences, concepts, models of uh, occupational safety and health training in the whole educational sector, starting from kindergarten. So they collect good examples. And I don't know whether they have maybe already some examples on education on UV radiation and its, uh, yeah, its, its effects on human beings. So that could be an idea to get those people involved. Yes, thank you very much for that. Actually, I think we keep it uh, in mind. I think we are almost done. If there are unsuppressible uh, remarks, just let us know, switch on your microphone. I think we've had a very exciting meeting and we are all agreeing that we should avoid that human beings develop these kind of rather terrible lesions which will um, keep them suffering for the rest of their lives. And what we can do regarding outdoor workers particularly 
is that we've got all the necessary scientific information, which is actually in this position statement, which recently has been published in the Journal of the European Academy of Dermatology and Venereology. You can download it. And it's been written together actually with the social partners and uh, with the uh, scientific associations of the occupational physicians and the dermatologists. So hopefully um, this does find its way actually to, the, to politics. And the main problem which we've discussed today is underreporting. We do not know, as uh, Professor Stratigos has lined out, uh, the figures in so many countries. And we, we know from, for instance, Germany, where we've had, we've had 50,000 um, notifications since 2015 when it became an occupational disease that is amazingly frequent. It's the second most frequently recognized occupational disease of all occupational diseases in Germany. So that problem is out there. And WHO has understood that. And um, the ICD-11, as uh, Professor Stratigos has um, pointed out, uh, is going to um, make it possible and necessary if anyone codes for non-melanoma skin cancer, actually including basal cell carcinoma, they will be asked whether this is occupational in nature. And only if we have um, the notifications, it is possible to have some political leverage, that's clear. And the other idea in order to increase notification is to have it registered with population-based cancer registries and non-melanoma uh, skin cancer, as it's so frequent, they completely ignore it. Also in the EU statistics of cancers, it doesn't figure. That's something where we would have to change things in order to make clear to politicians that there is a problem and they need to tackle it. Um, apart from that, the incidence is so huge that um, it will, on the one hand, um, exceed the capacity of medical doctors to treat the patients, and on the other hand, um, exceed the capacity of social insurance systems in due to course, so, so necessary to do something. For workers, it would be absolutely essential to have surveillance, and uh, we can say surveillance only started in Germany once it was an occupational disease. So it would be so necessary to have solar UV induced skin cancer as an occupational disease in the European list um, of uh, occupational diseases. Only then prevention will really uh, get going and we will get uh, the figures actually. And it's so cheap, I can say it is no match to the cost of inactivity. So we should really do it. And so many speakers have made clear, we need workers education, we need to make workers know the risk they are running at these kind of workplaces. And we've heard from the patient actually what it means to have skin cancer. It is not a one-off thing. It needs permanent treatment. And you're always in the fear of new lesions to evolve once you have this kind of severe sun damage to your skin that so many workers have and that so many others in the general population have. Obviously, Australia tells us we need perseverance. We need, if we do something in terms of uh, prevention campaigns and concerted actions, we need to stay with it and not have it for once in a while in one country and then another country. We need to go on with this. Obviously, this what, uh, campaign which the EADV is running, your skin, the most important two square meters of your life, does really put together in a statement what is the problem. You only got one skin, so it's definitely worth to protect it and make sure that you don't get skin cancer. So thank you very much for listening to me. And now I would like to hand over to the director of the European Cancer Patient Coalition, Mrs. Antonella Cardone, who's made possible this meeting. Antonella. Thank you. Thank you, John. Thank you to all the participants uh, and uh, um, most of all the panelists has uh, contributed uh, so professionally to the discussion. Uh, I very briefly want to add just one thing. Uh, you probably saw circulating on the chat uh, that at TCPC we are putting together a web hub on uh, non-melanoma skin cancer. We are doing it uh, with the help of uh, John Sven and uh, uh, all of you. So please uh, uh, take a few moments to review it and uh, uh, supply any uh, available uh, relevant uh, resource uh, that you can think of. So I just uh, leave you with uh, some homework to do. So thank you, everyone. We do appreciate your, your help and uh, support to us and uh, to the cause of non-melanoma skin cancer. Thank you. Thank you all.
Uh, Antonella, could you send a link to all the participants that they can download the meeting? There you are. That's yes. excellent. Yes. Thank you so much again, Antonella, for making that possible and goodbye to everybody.